Okay, so this is the first chapter in the AP Environmental Science course. Um, since this is my first time doing this particular course lecture, please don't laugh at me. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. So the main point of chapter one is introducing you to basically the whole course, environmental science, and the kinds of topics that we're going to study, and five big themes. Well, this picture is showing you the Noose River in North Carolina, and uh, there was a story about the Noose River fish killer. Well, it was an organism called Fisteria, and it was killing a bunch of fish. And so some scientists went out there and noticed that they were becoming sick and confused um, and had memory impairment, and they saw that this weird Fisteria organism had 24 different life stages, which when you're talking about a little organism is a huge number, but 24 different life stages is a lot for any organism. And so they were wondering why it kept changing life forms. When it's in normal conditions, usually this organism will just feed on algae. But what they noticed is that when there were lots of nutrients put into the water, into the river, they turned into these carnivores and would feed into a fish and they would bury themselves into the fish body and then transform into another stage being an amoeba. And then they would transform to another life stage and form kind of a, a shell or a crust, a crust around them and kind of sink to the river bottom until nutrients came again. Well, where were all these nutrients coming from? Well, they were coming from what they believe was waste runoff. There were lots of suburban areas along the river. There were uh, industrial hog farms, agricultural fields. And so especially with the agricultural fields and hog farms, that's a lot of nutrients. That's a lot of fertilizer. That's a lot of pig poop going into the water. Well, when you add that into the water, that's called eutrophication. Eutrophication is adding a lot of nutrients. And so you might think that nutrients are good, but when it's too much, it can actually harm an ecosystem. And we'll get into a lot more of eutroph eutrophication in, in chapter three. But it caused a huge problem in the uh, fishing industry and seafood uh, sales in the North Carolina, North Carolina region. Um, but there was a problem too, and that some researchers said that the Fisteria thing was a hysteria, and there was no real toxin. Um, many years later, they did discover there was a toxin, um, but it, it, it kind of shows you that, well, several things, that humans are completely altering ecosystems and we're changing them in in most cases for the bad but it also becomes environmental issues you know the seafood industry doesn't want to say that there's some kind of toxin killing off their fish and endangering people because that would make the economics even worse so um, in, in environmental science studies you know, there's also there's always going to be conflicts between scientific study and economic interests. So what else that tells us is that environmental science can be controversial. So following a discovery, individuals, commercial interests, and the media can overstate or understate the problem, or disagree with the initial report, which is exactly what happened in the case of Fisteria. Sometimes we don't know you know what is hype and what is real when we watch the news and so even if you're watching a reputable network like CNN for example sometimes it's hard to really distinguish you know what is true and, and just really what is overblown um, even when we had West Nile virus when we had uh, avian flu bird flu you know those things those were such small cases and and H1N1, you know, such a few number of cases considering the amount of people, you know, in the community, in the city, in the state, in the country, and it was really overblown and lots of people were worried, kids weren't coming to school, um, and, and, and so 
you know, those are the kinds of things that can be blown out of proportion, especially if the media doesn't have the right um, information. Because what happened in the end with H1N1 um, viruses was that um, was that virus, um, excuse me, shots and vaccines were going through the roof. The sales were going through the roof. So sometimes there's a panic that's totally induced by the media, but we'll move on. So let's get into the meat of chapter one, and that's talking about what is environmental science. And when we talk about environmental science, one reason why I love this class is because there are so many parts to it and so many things that you in your career can go into that could potentially tie to the environment, either being an environmentalist, which we'll talk about in a second, or an environmental scientist. So the environment, all the conditions surrounding us that influence life. You have abiotic factors, which are the non-living components, soil, sunlight, water, temperature, and the biotic components, which are your um, living organisms. So environmental science is looking at all the interactions between humans and nature, between ecosystems, between communities, between populations, between species. So then a system that takes us to systems because we're looking at all these systems interacting together. And that's exactly what a system is, interacting components. Um, they can be man-made and if you've ever been to New York City, that is quite a subway system that they have. Um, or any kind of natural system like uh, the rock cycle, weather cycles, including the water cycle, uh, etc. So an ecosystem is composed of the living and non-living components. I mentioned biotic and abiotic. And so environmental studies are studying these interactions among human systems and those found in nature. But we also get to get into environmental policy or law economics, literature, ethics, you could go into math, okay? So all of these topics here we're going to get to study throughout the year. Ecology will be first, then we study uh, populations, then we will move on to climates and biomes. We will talk a little bit about chemistry. Um, throughout the year we incorporate law and ethics. We talk about politics and how policy is actually created and then the economics behind it. So it's not only a natural science or studying the natural science but it's also studying social sciences. This is just showing you how housing development uh, is one of the many ways in which humans have converted land from its natural state. So um, this is a figure from your textbook and it does not say um, where it's from. Um, it just shows that how we have turned these beautiful natural areas into developmental regions. And so you can imagine as you look in that picture where there's trees missing, that can lead to some environmental issues, which we'll talk about. Here's an example of urban sprawl. Okay, so LA in 1880 when there wasn't a whole lot there. 6,000 people lived in LA in 1880. And by 2009, over almost 4 million people live in the uh, center of LA. And then when you talk about the metropolitan area around LA and all the little suburbs, it's around 13 million. Um, my brother lives there, so I've been there a couple of times. The traffic is ridiculous. Humans are thought to be responsible for the extinctions of mammoths, giant sloths, and several birds. One bird in particular is called the passenger pigeon and um, was hunted to extinction for fun. Um, they weren't really eaten, but it was just um, for fun, for fun hunting millions of birds in a very short amount of years. However, humans have sometimes created opportunities from, for some species to thrive. Um, Native Americans have been known to create new ecosystems such as the grass prairie um, because they had set fires to keep trees from encroaching on them. And so some species um, came to be suitable for that environment in the grass prairie so they thrived, they went on to reproduce. <clears throat> 
Although we have increased human well-being, it comes at a cost. Cities cover, the, cover land that was once natural habitat. A few thousand can live in an area with minimal effects, but how could four million people live in a city such as LA and not have a huge effect on the environment? And as we get into a uh, discussion on cities and urban sprawl, you'll see the kinds of effects that humans have had. This was a picture that I had taken from a lecture that I attended as a student, and this was showing you, um, these are buffalo skulls, and how many millions were slaughtered in the 1800s. And they were they were uh, hunted to the point where I think where there was 50 left and then they were finally put in an area where they could thrive again and it has grown to a few thousand but they were in the millions um, and and as people had moved west that's when they started hunting them for food for game and then for their pelts so one of the critical questions uh, that environmental scientists have is whether the planet's natural life support systems are being degraded by human induced changes and that's what we're going to be looking at so much is how humans have in, uh, invaded and um, affected the environment well, one thing scientists will look at is are the services that natural ecosystems provide and that would be clean water timber fisheries and crops. So we need to look at the state of those services to make sure that they're not being overused. Environmental indicators describe the current state of the environment. So we look at things like with humans how you know if we have a high temperature we know that we might have an infection because we have a fever. If we have an increased heart rate at an unusual time that might be a signal that something is is wrong with our body. And so scientists will look at the same things in the environment like with oceans. They'll look at salinity, they look at temperature, they look at carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. And so they can detect changes in these indicators um, and they don't always tell us what's causing the change but they do tell us that we might need to look at that in more detail. And then sustainability is, you know, we use all this information about indicators in our services to reach sustainability. And sustainability is a major theme of the course and in throughout the textbook. And sustainability is living on the earth in a way that allows us to use its resources without depriving future generations of those resources. So it's doing the things that you guys have kind of grown up doing, turning off the lights when you're not in the room and saving electricity. Saving that electricity means we're burning less coal or another fossil fuel for that electricity. Turning off the water when you're brushing your teeth, you know, waiting to um, wash the dishes or wash the clothes until there's a full load there. So not depriving future generations and not depleting the resources as well and as we'll talk about in a minute we know we're depleting our resources. So the five global uh, environmental indicators are biological diversity, food production, surface temperature and carbon dioxide concentrations, human population and resource depletion and we're going to talk about each of those in detail. Here's a chart that you can uh, look at in more detail in your book which is on page six. So the five major indicators, global indicators, what has been going on and what the out outlook is for the future. So when you look at biological diversity for example, humans are causing a greater number of extinctions mostly due to habitat destruction or degradation and so the extinction rate is probably increasing because of humans beyond the natural extinction rate and so the outlook for the future extinctions are going to continue and so that is a pretty negative impact on the environment so I'll let you you can pause here and take a look at this chart or you can uh, take a look at it in on page six
So the first of the global environmental indicators is biological diversity. And diversity is just, the biodiversity is just the diversity of life formed in the environment. And so we look at it in three different ways, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. The first being genetic. Um, and I believe we get into this in chapter 18. And that's just looking at the different uh, individuals in a population. So high gen genetic diversity are going to be able to respond better to an environmental change. So they will go on to survive and then reproduce. And eventually uh, more species will evolve, which is speciation. If you have a low genetic diversity where the members of the populations are very similar and there's a drastic environmental change, you could say pollution or just a natural climate change or even a human induced climate change. You know, if those, if that uh, population with low diver genetic diversity can't survive that, then they're not going to go on to survive and reproduce. So gen uh, genetic diversity is, is going to be important. Species diversity is simply the number of species in an area. Okay, so the different individuals in a species will breed, produce offspring, and then you have a species, a group of organisms that is distinct from other groups and forms. And so, hence speciation, evolution of more species. So far on Earth, scientists have identified about 2 million and the most common estimate of species on Earth is 10 million, but there could be as many as 100 million. So even if there was 10 million, we only have one fifth of species identified. And one thing to keep in mind that is not on this um, slideshow is that 99% out of, of every species that have ever been alive is now extinct and we still have possibly 10 million species. So it's kind of something to think about. And it's not, of course, all human induced, but just think of all the species that have, you know, evolved and then become extinct just over the course of the 3.5 billion biological history of Earth. Ecosystem diversity, simply that. If I have more species, more ecosystems around, then those are going to be more resilient ecosystems and more productive. So we'll have more species um, and they're not as in danger for extinctions. Background extinction rate, one in a million every year, meaning that one species in a million dies every year, but sometimes the rate can be 10,000 species a year. And a lot of that will depend on human activities, especially lately. Um, when we get into the geologic time scale and we'll look at major um, evolutionary events and major extinction events, you will see that currently we are undergoing a massive extinction event and it's triggered by humans. And more species are becoming extinct every year because of humans. And again, the most um, common reason is habitat destruction or degradation. This picture here is just showing you species diversity, the variety of things that are on Earth. Um, a majority of that, well, maybe a majority, a healthy, healthy percentage of all the species that have been identified are insects and then plants. Just an FYI. And then we talked about that, ecosystem diversity. All right, the next global indicator is food production. And this is when we will get into Food Inc. and talk about uh, the most common crops, where the food is going, are we gonna have enough food to sustain the human population? So we use science and technology to increase the amount of food that we can produce on land. And what you'll see in just a second in a graph, well, actually I can go back to that. This is showing you the amount of grain per capita, which per capita is per person, of grain that has been produced since the 1950s. So while grain production globally has actually increased dramatically, um, well, maybe not dramatically, but fairly steady since the 1950s, 
um, because of irrigation, fertilization, um, new crop varieties, and the GMOs, the genetically modified organisms, um, per capita has actually started to level off a little bit. Now let me go back. Okay. Um, so the three most common crops are wheat, corn, and rice. That's something to remember. And the one that is close behind are soybeans. And one thing that we need to think about with the crops is although that it has grown a lot since the 1950s, many things are still going to affect how much grain is grown. And a big one is going to be soil. You need to have healthy soil in order to keep the crops growing. And as you will see when we get to agriculture and forestry, um, companies or even villagers will harvest their crops so quickly and plant new ones in the soil that the soil doesn't have enough time to regenerate itself and become fertile again. Um, other things, there have been crop diseases. I talked about the soil de uh, degradation and then climatic conditions. Some areas can undergo, undergo drought where others undergo flooding and then that just ruins their crops. And in the U.S., we use more grain, especially corn, to feed our livestock than we do ourselves. All right, the next global indicator, well, it's a combination of two, are the surface temperature of the globe and carbon dioxide concentrations. Now, greenhouse gases. These are gases, and I'm going to go back to this in a second. Okay, the greenhouse effect is actually a really good thing for the earth. It keeps us at about an average, a global average of 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So what happens is uh, solar energy comes in and some is re-radiated back out into space um, as it's reflected from clouds a lot of times. Other times, or, or other amounts are um, taken into the soil and absorbed. And then other times it'll strike the surface and then go back out into the atmosphere. Where's my arrow? Okay, here we go. So this is showing you right here that it got re-radiated back out into space. And here these gases kind of got trapped in the atmosphere. That is the greenhouse effect. So we need it. Um, and here I show you uh, methane, carbon dioxide, water vapor, CFCs, which are man-made greenhouse gases, ozone and nitrous oxide are the main greenhouse gases. But if we keep increasing the amount that gets produced from human or anthropogenic activities, um, the, the global surface temperature is expected to increase. And this is a highly controversial topic because generally, and not all, but generally the Republican Party in the U.S. tends to think that um, global warming and greenhouse effect, well greenhouse gases, you know, affecting that and, you know, the ozone holes and all that is kind of a bunch of hooey and has been blown out of proportion. And whereas the Democrats are more of the environmentalists and we'll see that when we watch An Inconvenient Truth and Al Gore led uh, that movement with the An Inconvenient Truth and he of course as a Democrat. Out of the uh, six greenhouse gases, the most important one that we look at as environmental scientists is carbon dioxide. And we look at that because we can correlate um, carbon dioxide concentrations going up as well as generally the global surface temperature. So that's something that scientists really take a look at. They look at surface temperature at the same time as they look at carbon dioxide. And you can imagine, as you see in this graph here, that as the automobile industry exploded, so did carbon dioxide um, concentrations, excuse me, concentrations in the atmosphere, and then the temperature. Now we'll talk about later on why that global temperature will kind of go up and down like that. It's actually a very common graph that we'll look at. 
I'm going to try and speed it up a little bit because I've noticed I've taken quite a while just to get where I am now. Um, all right, so the human population. Our human population is currently at 7 billion. We reached 7 billion in March of 2012, and we're expected to reach 8 billion in the spring of about 2024. Now, that may sound like a while away, but that's only 12 years. 12 years to add 1 billion people to the Earth. Now, keep in mind that in 1960, there was only 3 billion people on Earth. It did not take very long in, what is that, 50 years to more than double what was on the Earth in 50 years. Okay, and we'll get into a lot of that um, about population. It's, it's quite an interesting topic. And over a million people are added to the Earth every five days. The current growth rate of population is about 1.14%, and that is almost half of what it was in the 60s. So efforts to control human population is successful. But with any you know explosive growth like our human population, it's going to take time for that rate to actually affect the global population. Um, in terms of populations of countries, China is number one with a billion three hundred eighty seven million people. India is second with a billion two hundred and fifty five million people. And the US has a population of around three hundred and twenty million. And that's a number that you'll need to to know. This is just showing you a town in India. Um, they live in slums. They live in shanty towns. There's lots of people living in boxes. They pee and poop in the street. Um, you know, it's it's not the healthiest of situations, and their population has kind of gone, you know, out of control. And we will talk about that. We're going to talk about how the governments of China and India have addressed their issues of population, considering their populations are more than four times that of the U.S. The next uh, global environmental indicator is resource depletion, and this will be a big topic that we cover second semester when we talk about renewable and non-renewable resources. So as the human population has grown, um, especially more than doubling in just 50 years, where we're using a lot of the Earth's resources, and especially in developed countries, developed countries are using a heck of a lot more resources than the developing or what used to be called third world countries. Non-renewable resources are those like coal, oil, and uranium, uh, natural gas, meaning, you know, in a, they're finite for now and cannot be renewed or reused on a human life scale. Eventually, they can be found again since they're fossil fuels. They take millions of years to form. Um, other natural resources like, like aluminum or copper also exist in finite amounts, but those we can at least recycle and reuse. This is just showing you um, what percentage of resources are being used in developed versus developing nations. And keep in mind that only 20% of the world's population is from developed nations. So let's take a look at even just, here we go. Let's even just look at paper, paper usage. 84% of paper is used by people in developed nations, US. Um, Europe, Australia, but developed nations only are 20% of the world's population. So we use an inordinate amount of uh, resources. And development, as we'll talk about in population studies, as the economy develops and they're going from a developing to a developed country, obviously their resource consumption are, is going to increase. Um, because they have more needs. You know, they'll actually use electricity. They'll use cell phones. They'll use computers, etc. Um, Easter Island. Tragedy of the Commons is basically a concept where the resources of a common area have been depleted because the people were interested in themselves more than the whole. And so we'll hopefully get to see a video about Easter Island. It's a fascinating story and there's actually a few um, hypotheses about why these people went nearly extinct.
um, with one theory being that they had used up the initial the indigent people had used up the wood for moving the large statues for building boats to go out and fish um, for building homes and didn't allow or didn't plant any extra trees thereby not letting any trees grow so they cut down all their trees and then had nothing left um, but we'll talk about tragedy of the commons in great detail a little bit later so sust sustainable development again sustainability is a big theme in environmental science and it's basically being able to use the resources without depleting them so future generations will have them and so you guys are in a, a quite good position to help make some changes for the future to get some uh, more quote-unquote green people into the White House and, and make some actual good legislation for environmental science or environmentalists this is a way of being sustainable uh, riding your bike to work riding your bike to school and that is going to be you know um, a benefit if some of you go to college and live in the dorms when I had gone to UT I took my car and I always had to park at Dishfalk field at the baseball field across the highway so then I'd go to work I'd have to get a ride back to the dorm you know and I got you know maybe five hundred dollars in parking tickets because I wouldn't move my car early enough in the morning because I worked until midnight or, or one in the morning and it was a pain so I highly recommend that if you live on a nice big campus and you're able to live um, in the dorms on campus do not have a car you will not need it walk everywhere and that's kind of the downfall of urban sprawl and especially a city like San Antonio San Antonio is so spread out it's hard to walk anywhere um, and that's what was kind of the nice thing about the river walk you can visit all those places by just walking the Pearl Brewery um, you know and so forth so in order to live sustainably we need to use our non-renewable resources carefully and sparingly so our coal our oil our natural gas we need to you know be modest and conservative renewable resources must not be depleted faster than they can regenerate and we'll talk about that um, renewable resources um, such as solar wind hydro or water um, and hydrogen and environmental systems must not be da damaged beyond their ability to recover so like I said humans keep degrading um, ecosystems and habitats and sometimes to the point where the species can't recover and sometimes even ecosystems okay especially in terms of cutting down the rainforests or some people who are um, different kinds of agricultural practices are destroying the ecosystem in the soil so that those um, ecosystems and crops can't come back when you look at needs it sometimes it's nice to actually look and evaluate of what you really need in life and the basic human needs air water food and shelter we might say we need electricity we need a phone we need you know AC um, but we don't need those things to survive and sometimes it's nice to be a little bit modest and think about people in a developing country who don't have any of those things so one of your first assignments as we get into the heart of the environmental science course is to calculate your ecological footprint and that is basically how much um, you consume as a person and it's ex expressed in an area of land sometimes they'll say hectares and a hectare is about two and a half acres and so when you go online and you're calculating it they're gonna look at how many miles you fly every year how many miles you drive what kind of food do you eat are you a vegetarian um, how big of a house do you have what how big of a car do you have etc and then you'll look at how many earths does it take to sustain you or the excuse me the the global population if everyone lived like you and for an average person in the US it is about five globes it would take five earths if everybody lived like Americans and that's really something to think about 
when you think about the resources that you use. Now since we've already gone through the scientific method, you've done a lab, hopefully you watched my little cartoon, I'm really not going to go through these slides, um, just ex except to tell you to make sure that you understand the different steps of the scientific method. So the first step is to observe and question, uh, create a hypothesis and educate a guess. Note on this second bullet here that a null hypothesis is a statement that can be proved wrong. So the example there, fish deaths have no relationship to something in the water. So you're intended to prove it wrong. When scientists collect data, you need to repeat it. You need to uh, ideally have high accuracy and high precision. Make sure you understand the difference between accuracy and precision. Once they have gathered all their data, then they start to analyze their results. And then they will start coming to a sense of reasoning. And they can use inductive or deductive reasoning. And it is important that you know both. Inductive is going from general, uh, oh, I knew I was going to do that. Inductive is going from specific to a general statement. So example, my small sample of songbird, my specific songbird doesn't chirp loudly. So all songbirds don't chirp loudly. So inductive goes from specific to general. Deductive is the opposite. Deductive is going from general to specific. So air pollution kills trees. I see one dead tree, so it must have been killed by air pollution. Once the scientists have analyzed their data, come up with some conclusions, then they will start to present their papers. This is totally out of order, but that's showing you the examples of low accuracy and high precision. All right, so once the scientist has presented his paper and disseminated the facts to the scientific community, it's either going to be elevated to a theory or law or completely rejected. A theory means that it has been repeatedly tested and confirmed and is widely accepted by the scientific community. So theory of evolution, Big Bang theory, theory of relativity. Um, a natural law is one that is a theory has been tested and there's no known deviation. So Newton's laws, um, laws of thermodynamics, those are considered laws because at least on Earth, those are proven to be absolutely true. A controlled experiment is conducted in, a, in the controlled conditions of a laboratory. And this is just giving you an example. A natural experiment is when you have um, a natural event that acts like a treatment in an ecosystem. And this was a really good example. When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, um, scientists had looked at this sp one specific area and you can see there at the top left picture um, that that was a picture taken in 1979 before the eruption and the top right is the exact same location uh, about two years after the eruption and then the bottom picture is the same location in 2009 so it shows you um, succession in this case this is called secondary succession where an ecosystem is growing back from some kind of catastrophe. Science pre uh, presents unique challenges because there's no control planet to compare Earth with. So we're kind of doing things on the fly sometimes and we're doing what we think is right, but sometimes it's difficult to decide if one um, method is going to be better or worse than the next especially if there had been no experiment, you know, prior to that one. Environmental science has so many interacting parts, so it's not easy to apply one system to another. And human well-being is a concern because people that are unable, that should say because people who are unable, to meet their basic needs are less likely to be interested in saving the environment. And that is going to be true because if people don't really have access to potable or drinking water or an actual toilet or cooking coals, then they're not really going to be on the bandwagon to save the environment when they don't even have their basic needs met.
And this final picture is showing you women in India who sit in um, heavy metals, because heavy metals are involved in the making of computers, and they're taking out um, parts of computers, and that is their job. Well, this just is about to hit 40 minutes, so I hope you enjoyed the chapter one lesson.